Hello everyone, and welcome back to Conspiracy Seed. Uh, this week, while I'm kind of sorting through recommendations that I have, we'll be talking about the infamous Jonestown, the People's Temple Cult, and Jim Jones. It's going to be my single longest video to date, not including all the supercuts, which of course are going to be quite a bit longer because there are at least three videos in one. If you like these longer videos, let me know, or if you prefer them around the 10-ish minutes. Also let me know and I can create like a part two or three of long topics such as this one. Thank you for choosing to spend some time with me today. I truly do appreciate it. It means the world. Let's get into it. Jim Jones was born on May 13th, 1931 in Indiana to James Jones and Lynetta Putman. His father, James, was a disabled World War I veteran who had breathing difficulties due to chemical weapon attacks in the trenches. This illness led to financial problems within the family, and in 1934, the family was evicted from their home due to missing mortgage payments. Their relatives purchased a shack for them to live in, so at the very least they weren't homeless, but the shack was just that. It was a shack. It didn't have plumbing, it didn't have electricity. While they still had hard financial times, they relied on extended family to help make ends meet. They would often forage the nearby forest for food. Jim's mother had no real maternal instincts, and she would frequently neglect Jim. When he started going to school, his extended family said that they would cut off their financial assistance unless his mother got a job. Which, personally, that makes sense to me. <laughs> I wouldn't want to be financially assisting someone who doesn't didn't seem to have any interest in helping themselves. With his mom now working outside the house and his father often in the hospital, Jim's parents were absent a lot during his childhood, and he was left to be cared for by neighbors and relatives. Myrtle Kennedy, a neighbor of the family and the pastor's wife, developed a special relationship with Jim. She gave him a Bible and encouraged him to read and study it. He became very religious based off of this relationship and would attend multiple churches each week, getting baptized in several of them. This is where his desire to become a preacher came from, as he decided around this time to become one and began to practice preaching in private. They made pitch black zero sugar slaps. His neighbors reported around this time as well that Jim was an unusual child who was obsessed with religion and death. A biographer suggested that he developed these unusual interests because he found it hard to make friends. Now, in my personal opinion, having been a child once, it also could have been the other way around, where he had a hard time making friends because of these interests. Jones became very interested in politics as well, and while he read from many walks of politics, including Hitler, Stalin, Marx, Mao Zedong, and Gandhi, he didn't really spout or believe any radical political views in his youth. Once he was asked about his childhood, and he said the following, I was ready to kill by the end of the third grade. I mean, I was so aggressive and hostile, I was ready to kill. Nobody gave me love, any understanding. In those days, a parent was supposed to go with a child to school functions. There was some kind of school performance and everybody's parents was there but mine. I'm standing there, alone. I was always alone. Jones would continue to be different and stand out from his peers throughout school and would almost always have a Bible with him. Jones would frequently confront his schoolmates for drinking beer, smoking, and dancing. His parents separated and divorced in 1945. I can see why. Jones is a square. He moved with his mother to Richmond, Indiana, where he finished schooling in 1948. With the divorce, he and his mother stopped receiving financial assistance from their family, and Jones got a job at the local hospital. This is where he met his soon-to-be wife, Marceline Baldwin. Marceline was a Methodist, and they would frequently argue about the church's racial segregation practices, which Jones was adamantly against. In 1951, a 20-year-old Jim Jones began to attend gatherings of the Communist Party in the city of Indianapolis. With his public affiliation with the Communist Party being known, his family faced harassment from government authorities. Jones was frustrated with the persecution of communists in the United States and thought to himself, how can I demonstrate my Marxism? The answer he came up with? Infiltrate the church. Jones became a pastor and moved to Indianapolis with his wife. There, he would be a guest minister for multiple churches and gained popularity in the area. Five to seven years later, Jones would start his own religion, which he called the People's Temple. William Brammer was a popular minister in the area that helped Jones' church raise to fame and helped him gain almost a thousand followers. Haha, <laughs> haha, I could have a thousand followers. Hit, hit subscribe. The church practiced what it called apostolic socialism. He would often preach about and praise Stalin and Lenin as heroes. In the early 1960s, Jones wanted to make a temple for his church and settled on Brazil. He stopped in Guiana on the way there, influencing his later decision to move the church there. After essentially being run out of Indiana for allowing integration in his church, 
Jones moved to California, where he opened branches of his church in both San Francisco and Los Angeles. In 1973, the temple directors passed a resolution to establish an agricultural mission in Guyana. This was mostly due to political pressure the church was facing the United States with its close ties to the Communist Party. Jones felt that due to this pressure, the church and its members needed an escape plan just in case. He picked Guyana due to it being English-speaking, socialist, and predominantly indigenous people. He felt it would make a peaceful place to live for the African members of the temple. Jones thought that he brought enough uh, influence and people to the table that the country that he called small, poor, and independent would allow him to easily obtain influence and official protection. He wanted his commune to be near the border of Venezuela and pitched the idea to the Guyana government who was worried about military insurrection by Venezuela. In 1974, he negotiated a lease of over 3,800 acres near the disputed border with Venezuela, which was isolated, had low soil fertility, and the nearest body of water was seven miles away. I don't know if you can do the math here. That is not good land. That is bad land if you're trying to start a town. They did, it, they did it here in Utah, though, so... 500 members of the church began construction on Jonestown, and they encouraged more to relocate to the settlement. Jones saw Jonestown as both a socialist paradise and a sanctuary from media scrutiny. In 1976, Guyana approved the lease for the 3,800 acres. Guyanese officials were paid off to help safeguard shipments of firearms and drugs through customs. Jones reached an agreement with the country that would permit temple members mass migration. He told the government that they were skilled and progressive, showed off an envelope that he claimed contained $500,000, and stated that he would invest most of the group's assets into the country. The immigration procedures were compromised to inhibit the departure of temple defectors and curtail the visas of temple opponents. Jonestown was seen as a benevolent communist community, with Jones himself saying, quote, I believe we are the purest communists there are. And then his wife described the town as, quote, dedicated to live for socialism, total economic and racial and social equality. And then she said, we are here living communally. She put a lot of ands in there where it wasn't needed. <laughs> Could have just used a comma. Jones, however, would not permit members to leave the town without his express prior permission. In the summer of 1977, Jones and several hundred temple members moved to Jonestown to escape the building pressure from the San Francisco media investigators. He left the same night that an editor at New West Magazine read him an article to be published the next day detailing allegations of abuse by former members. After the mass migration, the small town that had been built quickly became overcrowded. The population at this point was around 900 for Jonestown. Many members of the church believed that Jonestown would be as promised, a utopia. However, once Jones arrived, life in town drastically changed for the people that were already there. Movie nights were soon propaganda nights, as the movies they brought were replaced with Soviet propaganda shorts and documentaries on American social problems. After Jones arrived, bureaucratic requirements sapped resources for other needs. As such, buildings fell into disrepair and weeds grew in the fields. Jones would talk to the congregation about his Soviet allies and supposed mercenaries sent by a defector of the group who became outspoken against them. For the first several months, members would work six days a week from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. with one hour for lunch. Once Jones' health started to decline, his wife began to run the operations around the camp. With her running things, the work week went to an average Western work week of eight hours per day, five days per week. Once the workday ended, people would gather in the pavilion to attend classes and do activities. Jones would often compare the camp to the North Korean system of working eight hours a day followed by eight hours of study, and we all know how great North Korea is, so I don't see how this couldn't work. Children were taken to a communal care area and were only allowed to see their parents briefly at night. The town was poor, as it didn't export anything, and they couldn't be self-sufficient as the soil was no good. The camp basically ran on social security checks sent by the US government to help import food. So, the United States was sending people in Jonestown social security checks with they, which they would sign over to the People's Temple and then Jim Jones would use it to import food and that's how they were living, was on the government dime for a country they didn't even live in. 
The U.S. Embassy in Guyana would frequently ask members who were signing over their checks to the church if they were held against their will. None of the 75 people interviewed said that they were there against their wills, or that they were being forced to sign over their welfare checks, or that they wanted to leave Jonestown. 70% of the Jonestown population was African American, with 691 out of the 999 total people being African American. Jones would frequently tell his followers about how he feared for Jonestown's safety as he believed the CIA and other agents were conspiring with capitalists to destroy the town and its inhabitants. It sounds like Jones was doing a pretty good job of destroying the town himself. Jones would conduct what he called White Nights, where purported emergencies would arise. The members got four options. Attempt to flee to the Soviet Union, commit revolutionary suicide, stay in Jonestown and fight, or flee into the South American jungle. Jones would regularly study Adolf Hitler and Father Divine to learn how to manipulate members of a cult. One thing he learned was to find an enemy and to make sure that they know who that enemy is as it will unify the group and make them subservient to him. On at least two occasions during a white night, after revolutionary suicide was decided among the group, a simulated mass suicide was rehearsed. A defector by the name of Deborah Layton described the event in an affidavit and said the following. Everyone, including the children, were told to line up. As we passed through the line, we were given a small glass of red liquid to drink. We were told that the liquid contained a poison and that we would die within 45 minutes. We all did as we were told. When the time came when we should have dropped dead, Reverend Jones explained that the poison was not real and that we had just been through a loyalty test. He warned us that the time was not far off when it would become necessary for us to die by our own hands. The temple had received monthly half-pound shipments of cyanide since 1976, after Jones obtained a jeweler's license to buy the chemical to clean gold. Jones's paranoia grew after his drug usage, and he became fearful of a government raid on the commune, citing concerns that the community would not be able to resist an attack. He would call alert, alert alert over the loudspeaker to call the community together into the central pavilion where there were armed guards with guns and crossbows. One drill lasted for six days. It's known as the six day siege which is kind of funny because they were just playing pretend. There was no siege. This was used afterwards by Jones as a symbol of the community's indomitable spirit. For days on end, frightened townsfolk made rounds armed with machetes and whatever tools would serve as weapons. Jones claimed that surrounding the town were mercenaries bent on murder as well as the abduction of Jones's son and others. Jones's wife and others outside of the commune engaged in shortwave radio conversations with Jones, seeking to dissuade him from ordering mass suicide. Jones's health significantly declined in the town. In 1978, he was informed he had a possible lung infection, upon which he announced to his followers that he in fact had lung cancer, which was a ploy to foster sympathy and strengthen support within the community. It's said that he was abusing Valium, Quaaludes, stimulants, and barbiturates. He suffered from chronic insomnia and said that he would often go three or four days without sleep. During meetings and public speaking, his once sharp tongue became slurred. Words ran together or were tripped over or missed entirely. He would also not complete sentences even when reading like typed reports over the PA system. Leo Ryan, who represented California's 11th Congressional District, announced that he would visit Jonestown. He was friends with the father of Bob Houston, who was a temple member in California whose mutilated body was found near train tracks on October 5th, 1976, which was three days after a taped phone conversation with Bob's ex-wife in which leaving the temple was discussed. Over the following months, Ryan's interest was further piqued by allegations put forth by a group of ex-temple members called the Cons Concerned relatives. On November 14, 1978, Ryan flew to Georgetown along with a 17 person delegation, which included members of the concerned relatives as well as media personnel from NBC, The Washington Post, The San Francisco Examiner, and The San Francisco Chronicle. This is where things start to take a real turn for the worse. Upon this delegation landing in Guyana, the Jonestown lawyers initially refused to allow them access to the town. Three days later, however, the lawyers informed Jones that the delegation would likely leave for Jonestown that afternoon, regardless of whether he was willing to let them or not. 
The delegation, along with the two lawyers, came to an airstrip at Port Katuma, six miles from Jonestown, just a few hours later. Due to lack of space on the plane, only 14 of the 17-person delegation flew to Jonestown, while the rest stayed in Georgetown, which is the capital of Guyana. That night, they attended a musical reception in the settlement's main pavilion and were received warmly at the party. It was later reported, then verified, that Jones had run rehearsals on how to convince the delegation that everyone was happy and in good spirits. That evening, two temple members made their first move for defection. One of them passed a note to a member of the delegation that read, Dear Congressman, Vernon Gonzi and Monica Bagby, please help us get out of Jonestown. A child nearby, who was also a snitch, witnessed the act and yelled out to the other temple members. The person in the delegation who was given the note gave it to Congressman Ryan and he noted that something was very, very wrong. Congressman Ryan, along with his legal advisor, were the only ones who were allowed to stay the night in the town and all the other members were told they had to find other accommodations. In the early morning the next day, 11 temple members sensed danger and decided to walk out of Jonestown in the opposite direction from the Port Katuma airstrip. That afternoon, four families stepped forward and asked to be escorted out of Jonestown by the delegation. When Jones's adopted son Johnny attempted to talk one of the boys out of leaving, he was told, no way, it's nothing but a communist prison camp. Jones gave them permission to leave. He later that day stated in an interview with one of the NBC reporters from the delegation that the defectors were lying and they wanted to destroy Jonestown. Al Simon, a temple member, attempted to take two of his children to the delegation to process the paperwork to transfer back to the United States. Al's wife, Bonnie, summoned on the loudspeakers by the temple staff, loudly denounced her husband. Al pleaded with Bonnie to return to the United States, but she rejected. Most of the delegation began to depart, but Ryan and the U.S. Ambassador to Guyana, Richard Dwyer, stayed to process any additional defectors. Shortly before the truck left, Temple Loyalist Larry Layton demanded to join their group. Several of the defectors had suspicions about his motives and let the delegation know, however, he did join. Shortly after the truck departed, a temple member by the name of Don Sly grabbed Congressman Ryan while wielding a knife. Ryan was unharmed and others wrestled Sly to the ground. Dwyer strongly suggested that the congressman leave Jonestown while he filed a criminal complaint against Sly. Ryan left, promising to return later to address the dispute. The truck that was headed to the airstrip had stopped after the passengers heard of the attack and they took him on as a passenger before continuing towards the airstrip. The delegation originally only scheduled a 19-passenger airplane to fly them back, but due to the defectors, the group grew in number and now an additional aircraft was required. The group reached the airstrip around 4.30 p.m. and the planes were not there as scheduled. The group had to wait until about 5.15 for the planes, then the boarding process began. Layton was a passenger on the second scheduled plane, which was the first one to prep for takeoff. As the plane taxied to the far end of the strip, Layton pulled out a handgun and started shooting at the passengers. He wounded two people and was disarmed after the gun misfired. Meanwhile, others were boarding the larger plane in preparation for departure. As this was happening, a tractor with a trailer attached that had members of the temple's security squad pulled up to the airstrip and approached the plane. They opened fire with shotguns, handguns, and rifles from the trailer, while at least two temple members circled the plane on foot, taking pot shots. The first few seconds of the shooting were captured on tape by the NBC cameraman Bob Brown, who was killed alongside two delegation members and a temple defector within the first few minutes. Congressman Ryan was killed after being shot more than 20 times. Nine members of the delegation were wounded. The pilot and co-pilot of this plane, as well as an injured defector, ran to the other plane, which took off for Georgetown. The damaged first plane and delegation members were left behind on this trip. Before Ryan left Jonestown to his untimely death, he told one of the Jonestown lawyers that he would issue a positive report and that he would describe Jonestown in basically good terms. Ryan stated that none of the 60 people that he had targeted for interviews wanted to leave, and that 14 defectors constituted a very small portion of Jonestown residents, and even if 200 of the 900 plus people wanted to leave, quote, I'd still say you have a beautiful place here. When the lawyer told Jones, Jones said, I have failed. The lawyer reiterated to him that Ryan would make a positive report, but Jones just said, all is lost. After Congressman Ryan left for the airstrip after being attacked, Jim's wife, Marceline Jones, made a broadcast on the PA system stating that everything was all right and asking Jonestown residents to return to their homes. During this time, Temple Aids prepared a large metal tub with grape flavor aid, which is pretty much Kool-Aid, but... 
not as cool. I don't know, more flavorful, not as cool. Which was poisoned with seven different types of poison. The mixture was made with the help of the town doctor, Dr. Larry Schott. A Texan native who got sober with the help of Jones, who then paid for his college education to become a doctor. Larry had been researching the best way for a person to die in advance of the foreseen mass suicide. About 30 minutes after Marceline's announcement, Jim Jones made his own announcement, calling all people immediately to the pavilion. There's a 44 minute tape known as the death tape that has part of the meeting that Jones called inside the pavilion that evening, November 18th. It's online so you can listen to it. It's it's real sad. It's real sad. Especially near the end. There's like less people talking and like less crying and you just know it's because people are dying and it's just it's just so sad. It's very it's very haunting, I would say. But on the tape you can hear Jones urge members to commit revolutionary suicide. If you remember, such an act had been planned and practiced by the temple before. Temple member Christine Miller argued that the temple should actually attempt an airlift to the Soviet Union. Jim McElvain, who had actually just arrived two days earlier, argued against Miller, stating, let's make it a beautiful day, and later citing possible reincarnation. After several back and forths happened in which Jones argued that a lift to the Soviet Union would not be possible, along with other temple members being hostile towards Miller, she backed down. However, she might have backed down after Jones confirmed that Congressman Ryan had died, as she knew that they wouldn't have time for the Soviet Union to come get them before the United States found out about the congressman's death and then sent people to the town. When the security brigade returned to Jonestown, Tim Carter, a Vietnam War veteran, recalled that they had the thousand yard stare of weary soldiers. Once Jones confirmed that Ryan had died, no dissent is heard on the death tape afterwards. By this point, armed guards had taken positions surrounding the pavilion area. Several temple members then give speeches praising Jones and his decision for the community to commit suicide, even after Jones stopped appreciating the praise and just begged for the process to go faster. According to an escaped temple member, the first to take the poison were Ruletta Paul and her one-year-old infant. A syringe without a needle fitted was used to squirt poison into the infant's mouth, after which Paul squirted another syringe into her own. Others witnessed mothers and their babies first approach the tub containing the poison. One member said that Jones approached people to encourage them to drink the poison, and that after adults saw the poison began to take effect, they showed reluctance to die. The poison caused death within 5 minutes for children, even less time for babies, and between 20 to 30 minutes for adults. After consuming the poison, people were escorted away down a wooden walkway leading outside the pavilion. It's unclear if they thought this was like another White Knight rehearsal at first, or if they knew that this was the real thing. In response to reactions of seeing the poison take effect on others, Jones said, Die with a degree of dignity. Lay down your life with dignity. Don't lay down with tears and agony. I tell you, I don't care how many screams you hear, I don't care how many anguished cries. Death is a million times more preferable to ten more days of this life. If you knew what was ahead of you, if you knew what was ahead of you, you'd be glad to be stepping over tonight. A member described a scene of hysteria and confusion as parents watched their children die from the poison. He also stated that most present just quietly waited their turn to die, and that many would just walk around as if they were in a trance. The crowd was surrounded by armed guards, offering members the option of death by poison or death by a guard's hand. Tim Carter, a survivor of the incident, theorized that the day's lunch had been tainted with sedatives to make people less reluctant. You can hear the screams of children and adults on the tape as they were easily captured. As more and more temple members died, the guards themselves were called in to die by poison. Jones was found laying dead next to his chair in the pavilion between two other bodies, his head cushioned by a pillow. He didn't die from poison, but instead by a gunshot wound to his left temple. The gunshot wound, according to the medical examiner, was self-inflicted. The events that occurred at Jonestown was the greatest single loss of American civilian life in a deliberate act until 9-11. That's Jonestown. What do you guys think? It's, it's so sad. It's such a terrible tragedy with so much just loss of life that's unnecessary. It's very, very sad. Like I said, let me know if you kind of like this longer video or if you would have preferred I split this up into two or even three shorter videos. If you have any suggestions for videos, leave them down in the comments below. 
Thank you for choosing to spend some time with me again today. Uh, I'll have a Roswell video coming out in the near future, so keep an eye out for that. It'll probably be longer unless you guys like the shorter ones, in which case it'll probably be multiple parts. And thank you for watching. I hope you guys enjoy the rest of your day, and I'll catch you in the next one.